So welcome to the Heidelberg Joint Colloquium of today. So we have as our speaker, uh, Paula Penigia. I hope I pronounced it well. I should by now have learned how to pronounce it, but it's... <laughs> um, so Paula did her PhD here in Heidelberg and uh, then went for postdoc to uh, Leiden Observatory. Um, then moved to uh, Tucson in Arizona on a, on a Hubble Fellow and then uh, got a uh, Sofia Kovalevskaya Award to start her group here at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy up the hill here. And so she started a couple of months ago and she's now building up her group. Um, and the topic is uh, planet formation and so she will talk about her work and we're very looking very much forward to the talk so let's give her a warm welcome <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's actually a big uh, honor to be here because uh, nine years ago I started my PhD at ETA with Kiss and it's a pleasure to be introduced by him and to be now in this site and giving a talk. So in this presentation I'm going to talk about uh, an overview of my research since I started my PhD which is focused on understanding the very first steps of planet formation. That means the growth from cosmic dust to planetesimals, which is uh, kilometer-sized objects. And let me start with a motivation based on exoplanets. So in 1995, the first exoplanet was discovered around a main sequence star. And since then, the amount of exoplanets discovered has increased exponentially. You can see that here in the plot where I have the cumulative number of detections as a function of years in the last two decades. The colors here represent the method that was used to find these exoplanets. Up to, he, up to today, we have around 4,100 exoplanets discovered. And due to this growth in discoveries is the reason why a part of the Nobel Prize of Physics of this year was given to the two authors of the paper in 1995. From these discoveries, we have learned that there is a large diversity of planets. And this can be seen in this plot, where we have the mass of the planets in Jupiter masses as a function of period in days. And if we overplot the location of our planet Earth and Jupiter, this is where they lie. You can see that there are a little bit outliers on this plot. In the case of Jupiter, we have found planets with similar mass or even more massive, but the locations are usually closer in. There is, of course, an observational bias here. These uh, uh, planets are known as cold Jupiters, and these ones very close to the star are known as hot Jupiters. In the case of the Earth, we haven't found a, a Earth at the location where our planet is, but we have found several planets with similar mass. But most of the planets found so far lie between the Earth mass and the, the Neptune mass. And you can see uh, that here in this histogram where we have the uh, uh, count of exoplanets discovered as a function of planet radius in Jupiter radii. And here I have plot where uh, the Earth planet is and Neptune. And you can see that most of the planets are found between these two. And these are known as super-Earths or mini-Neptunes, and there are no such planets in our own solar system. Despite the fact that we have a large diversity of exoplanets, we also see some trends, in particular with stellar metallicity and stellar mass. And this is shown here in this cartoon, where we have both, and the Sun is located in the middle. The points represent the planets that have been found, and the size of these points represent the masses or massive of the planets. And you can see two trends. The first trend is that giant planets occur more frequently around more massive stars and around more metal-rich stars. This is this part of the plot. The other trend is that sub-Neptunes occur in a star with a wide range of metallicity, but they are more common around low-mass stars which are this part of the plot. This diversity of exoplanets and the uh, trends that we see so far must have an origin 
in the initial conditions and the places where these planets are born, which are protoplanetary disks. So we need to look back in time and study these regions and see how the initial conditions and the physical processes of protoplanetary disks can uh, influence the final output. And this is a movie from exoplanets to protoplanetary disk. We can, of course, not um, put our clocks back and do this, but we can observe very young stars that still have protoplanetary disk in order to understand what are the conditions in these objects to form planets. So what do we know about protoplanetary disks? The initial composition of these objects is mainly gas, 99% of the material is gas, and only 1% of the material is dust. This dust initially should be as the interstellar medium, so submicron or micron-sized particles that should grow and eventually form the core of giant planets or terrestrial planets. The lifetime is around 3 to 10 million years. After that time, all the gas has been accreted onto the star, and after that, only dust and planetesimals remain in the disks, and probably also uh, planetary embryos. Those disks without gas are known as debris disks. Because all the gas is accreted in this time scale, we expect that at least giant planets are formed be before all the gas is gone. And we also know that this disk uh, extend up to 1,000 AU, and, and a as a consequence of that, the temperature of the disk range between thousands of Kelvin, very close to the star, to few Kelvin in the outer disk. And as a result, we can observe these objects at very different wavelengths, from optical to centimeter wavelengths. And actually, when we observe at different wavelengths, we can trace the evolution of the dust particles. And this is because when we observe at optical and near-infrared scatter light, we are sensitive to the warm layers of the disks, which is represented here in this cartoon. And we have now powerful instruments that give us very high angular resolution and sensitivity observ uh, observations of disks. And one of those is a sphere at the VLT, and you see here a collage of images of that kind of observations, where we have several kind of structures that I'm going to talk later. So here we are tracing the micron-sized particles that are in the surface layers of the disk. On the other hand, if we want to learn about the millimeter, centimeter sized particles that are located in the cold mill plane of the disk, we observe at millimeter wavelengths with a very powerful interferometric uh, telescopes. And these are recent observations with ALMA, which is the most powerful uh, interferometric telescope in the world of protoplanetary disks, and you can see that all of these objects also have structures. The most important thing is that by observing the dust, we can actually learn about the main component of the disk, which is the gas. And this is because all the dynamics and all the processes that dominate the evolution of the dust particles are regulated by the gas. So when we, learn, we can learn about what is the gas and what is the structure of the gas by the observing the dust. So with that uh, motivation in mind, let me give you an outline of my talk. I'm going to start with an introduction about the dust evolution models. Then I'm going to talk about uh, what we have learned when we compare the results of these models with observations. And I'm going to end with current investigations and future perspectives in this field. So when I talk about dust evolution, I talk about the transport and the collisions of the particles. And these two are very important to model together because they are strongly correlated. We can transport uh, grains in the disk by different mechanisms that are shown in this cartoon. And I'm going to go through all of them in the next, in next slide. So we can actually have Brownian motion with random movement of the particles in the disk. And this only affects very small grains, so submicron, micron sized particles. We can also have settle into the mid plane, so the small grains in the surface layers can uh, go to the mid plane. And we can calculate 
what are the settling velocities by assuming the balance between the drag force and the gravitational force. By doing that, we find that the settling velocities are proportional to the grain size, which is something that we expect. The bigger the grain, the faster it goes to the mid plane. These discs are also turbulent, and grains can couple and decouple continuously in the turbulent eddies. And that diffusion of the grains and this coupling of the grains in these turbulent eddies depends also on the grain size. And finally, we can also have that the grains move towards the star due to radial drift. I'm going to explain where this movement originates in the next slides. But what is important here is that also depends on the particle size. So in conclusion of this slide, is that all of these transport mechanisms depends on the particle size, and this is why we should model it together with the collisions of the particles. Because when we have collisions, we can have different outcomes that can change the particle size. So we can have a stickiness of the particles, we can have bouncing of the grains. In this case, the two particles doesn't change, uh, don't change the size. We can have mass transfer, in which case, uh, usually the small grains transfer some mass to the big grain. We can have fragmentation of the particles, and we can have erosion. And we can calculate, based on the velocities that particles reach at a given distance from the star, what is the potential outcome. And this is what you see here in this plot, where we have the outcome of collisions calculated at three astronomical units from the star. In both axes, you see the grain size, so there are collisions with two different grains. You see, for example, that small grains, micron-sized particles, they always stick. Particles between micron and one centimeter, they can stick or uh, uh, transfer uh, or bounce, sorry. But the uh, general out outcome is that there is growth. This is why it's in green. Once particles reach sizes of one centimeter, they touch the bouncing barrier because they cannot continue growing. This is why it's in yellow. But if one of the grains can manage to grow bigger, then we will have mass transfer, and this helps to grow. And eventually, when particles reach meter-sized objects and this location of the disk, they will fragment due to the high velocities that they reach. But how we actually know what is the fragmentation velocity of the particles? So what is the threshold of the velocities before they fragment? We know. Uh, these values based on numerical experiments and laboratory uh, experiments. And what I'm showing you here are results of num numerical simulations of collisions that happen with uh, uh, aggregates that are composed by water ice versus aggregates that are composed by silicates. In one of the movies, you will see that the collision happens at 8 meters per second, and in the other movie, it happens at 2 meters per second. Initially, you see that also these aggregates are fluffy, but once they collide, they perfectly stick and they form a more compact object. On the other hand, if we, the, the collision happens with silicate grains, you see that some of the monomers, when they collide, they stick, but we also have fragmentation. And these numerical simulations agree mainly with the laboratory experiments, and the main conclusion that we have reached is that water ice uh, grains can have fragmentation velocities that are one order of magnitude higher than silicates. And the values are here. Why are uh, these different comes from, or where these different comes from? This is because the van der Waals forces that are the ones helping the particles to stick or, or, to, or to fragment are, uh, depends on the dipole moment of the grains. And for water, the dipole moment is very high. And I'm going to talk more about this in the uh, coming slides. I told you that one of the ways that we transport uh, grains in the disk is due to radial drift. And this uh, depends and it comes from the fact that the gas is not exactly Keplerian, but it's a slightly sub-Keplerian. And this is because if we take a parcel of gas in the disk, we need to take into account the gravitational force, the centrifugal force, but also the pressure support. And due to this term, the azimuthal velocity of the gas is not exactly Keplerian, but it depends on a second term that is proportional to the pressure gradient. The pressure is uh, proportional to the density and the temperature of the disk. Both are expected to decrease smoothly with radius. 
And as a consequence, this term is expected to be negative. If we put numbers to this equation, it's usually 99.9% .9 of the Keplerian speed. So it's a very uh, small difference. But it makes an effect in the dust because it doesn't feel this pressure support and the dust is moving exactly Keplerian. And therefore, it's constantly feeling a hand wind. Particles will lose angular momentum and drift inwards. A way that I usually um, use to explain this is um, by cycling. If you are cycling and you need to keep a constant velocity as particles need to keep the Keplerian speed, and you are feeling a headwind, you need to speed up. For a particle, that means to move inwards. The only way that the particles don't move inwards is that the headwind disappears, and that will happen when this term is zero. Or it could happen that you actually have a tailwind and you need to move outwards as a particle. How we can overcome that problem? One possibility, of course, is that instead of having a smooth pressure profile that decreases with radius, we have a pressure bump. The other possibility is that particles group, and as a consequence of that, the particles that are in the middle of that group don't feel that hand wind, and they will actually stop drifting and grow bigger. The other possibility is that you increase the cross section of the particles, and that means growing fluffy. But as you, can, as, as you saw in the uh, previous uh, numerical simulations, when you have collisions, particles usually end being very compact. So this maybe um, is not uh, a solution, but it's a possibility. You can see how uh, high are the radial drift velocities at a given distance from the star in this plot where I have the dust radial velocity as a function of grain size calculated at three astronomical units from the star. You see that the small particles that are well coupled to the gas move with the gas, but once they uh, grow in size and reach uh, sizes around one meter, they reach velocities of around 4,000 centimeters per second. So imagine two objects of one meter size colliding with these high velocities. They will probably fragment, and if the collision doesn't happen, they anyway will drift toward the star before they can grow to planetesimals. And in this movie, you will see an example of dust evolution models that include all the uh, transport mechanism, mechanisms that I showed you before, together with the collisions of the particles. And you will see the effect of the radial drift. So in, the, in colors, you will see the dust density distribution as a function of particle size and radius. We initially assume that all grains are micron-sized particles. And you see how in the inner part of the disk, where the densities are high, we have plenty of collisions, growth happens very fast. In the outer disk, where the densities are lower, the growth time scales are much longer. But once the particles reach a given size, they will all drift toward the star. And at million year time scales that are the typical average of protoplanetary the age or the average age of protoplanetary disk, we lose most of the pebbles in the outer disk and planetesimals in the inner disk. We know that this radial drift barrier must have a solution because we form planets. And one of the um, possibilities, as I explained before, is that there is a pressure bump in the disk. This was already introduced in 1972 in this paper by Whipple, where uh, he showed in a, a cartoon what uh, would happen if we have a pressure bump, which is the accumulation of dust particles in this location, as I explained you before. In this region, in the pressure, when the pressure gradient is positive, particles move outwards. Here, they move inwards. In the pressure maximum, they don't drift because this term is zero. The fundamental question that we ask nowadays is what can be this, the origin of these structures and how we can observationally test those ideas. So one potential uh, idea is that we have already a planet embedded in the disk, which is massive enough to open a gap in the gas surface density. And as a consequence of that, we expect the gas surface density here to increase with radius, we, which means we have a pressure bump. But this is not actually a solution because we need a planet to form the first planetesimals. So we reach a chicken and egg problem. Nevertheless, we have other uh, possibilities. It could happen that we have a region in the disk which have low turbulence. 
And in that region and at the outer edge of that region, we expect a bump to form in the gas density profile and trap particles. And I'm going to explain that later. We can also have that the magnetic fields in the disk can create inhomogeneities in the gas uh, profile. And these are MHD 3D simulations uh, done by who was a PhD student at MPIA uh, around 10 years ago, where you can see in these MHD simulations that uh, in the gas we have inhomogeneities and the amplitude of these pressure bumps is enough to trap particles, as I'm going to explain later. It can happen also that the disk is cold and very massive, and this can happen in disks that are very young, and as a consequence of that, they will fragment and form spiral arms, and these spiral arms are regions of high pressure where particles can be trapped. And this is a simulation where you see the distribution of centimeter-sized particles, and you see how they concentrate in these pressure bumps, or in these spiral arms. And finally, you can have vortices in the disk, which can form due to different instabilities, for example, the Rossby wave instability. And you can trigger this instability when you have a sharp um, variation of the gas density, for example, if you have a planet in the disk. In this uh, example, a planet is opening a gap and is creating different vortices at the uh, edges of, of the gap. And these vortices are merging and forming a large scale vortex that can trap particles at million year time scales. So to give you an overview, this very uh, first part of the talk, I told you that initially this protoplanetary disk have micron sized particles that are expected to collide and grow, but also they are expected to fragment. And this fragmentation is important because it continuously replenish the disk in a small grains that we observe in optical and uh, near infrared scatter light. Once particles reach certain sizes, they are expected to drift very fast towards the star, unless we have regions of uh, high pressure or pressure bumps where uh, particles can concentrate and grow to pebbles or planetesimals. And due to the accretion of pebbles and planetesimals, we can form the core of giant planets. And if a giant planet is formed, we can create a second generation of a particle trap that will help for the formation of a second planet. So let me move to the second part of my talk. What we have learned when we compare these dust evolution models with observations. So observations actually show us evidence of millimeter and centimeter sized particles in disks. And this comes from millimeter observations of disks. And why is that? What, what, where this evidence comes from? So the opacity at millimeter wavelength behaves as a power law which strongly depends on the particle size. And therefore, this opacity index, when it's lower than one, we can conclude that particles hang, have grown to millimeter centimeter sizes. We don't observe the opacity directly, but we observe the millimeter flux, which at a, a optically thin emission is proportional to the frequency to beta plus two. And this split beta plus two is known as the spectral index. Therefore, if you have observations of protoplanetary disks at two different wavelengths, millimeter wavelengths, you can calculate the spectral index and see if we have a millimeter grains. And this has been done already more than a decade ago, uh, where you see here the spectral index calculated between one and three millimeter. Lower than three means that we have millimeter grains. And this is as a function of the flux at one millimeter, which is a tracer of the disk dust mass when the emission is optically thin. This plot is telling us that independent on the star forming region and the stellar type and the disk mass, all of these objects have millimeter grains. When we compare with models that include the radial drift of the particles, we had a contradiction because the radial drift basically drains all the disk in millimeter grains. So back in, during my PhD studies, we wanted to study what kind of pressure bounds we needed to explain these observations. And we did that analytically by including a perturbation in the profile of the gas surface density and study what is the amplitude and wavelength that is needed to trap particles and explain the observations. So we, in this case in particular, I fixed the wavelength of this perturbation to one disk scale high and we study what is the minimum amplitude in order to have trapping. 
And in the, from that calculation, we conclude that it has to be at least 10% compared to the background density. We started to do simulations from this value and then increase it. And this is what you see in this plot. This is the main results of our models. This is the mass of the dust um, normalized by the initial mass of the dust calculated in the outer part of the disk as a function of time. You see that the models with ra radial drift and without pressure bumps makes all the brains to drift inwards. And we saw something similar with 10% of amplitude. We were quite surprised about this result because based on these calculations, we expected to have trapping in this case. Nevertheless, what happened in these models is that diffusion wins over the potential trapping of the particles. Because we have diffusion in, in this disk, and this diffusion makes the particles to move out of the pressure traps. So we needed to, to increase the amplitude of these pressure bumps in order to uh, uh, keep grains in the outer part of the disk. So we increased the amplitude to 30% and we saw a big difference. Then having amplitudes of 50 or 70% was like completely suppressing the radial drift. At that time, uh, there were also these MHD simulations that I show you that um, demonstrated that uh, when magnetic fields are included in simulations, we can have pressure bumps of the order of around 20 to 25%. We included these pressure bumps in our dust evolution models, and this is a, a snapshot of those simulations at one million year of evolution. Again, the colors show the dust density distribution as a function of grain size and distance from the star. You see that in this case, we retain particles in the entire disk, and when we compare what are the spectral index expected from these models, we actually had a much better agreement with observations. That to say that these observations were already telling us that to keep these millimeter grains, we needed to have pressure bumps in the disk. And we actually, at that point in 2012, we predicted how these pressure bumps will look if we will have high angular resolution observations with, a, with ALMA. And this is a synthetic image with ALMA from those models showing that we would expect to have concentric rings around the central star. This was 2012, and you can imagine how happy we were when we observed the first protoplanetary disk um, detected with ALMA at high angular resolution, HL tau, showing these concentric rings around the star. Then in 2016, we had uh, observations of the most study uh, disk, because it's the closest to us, TW Hydra, uh, 50 parsecs awake, also showing rings and gaps. And at the same time, we had a scatterlight observations with a sphere showing similar structures. Since then, the literature um, have a, a study what is the origin of these structures. The most common explanation in papers is that planets are creating these um, rings and gaps. But it's not the only possibility, as I showed you before. And there are different alternatives. And we are studying how we can actually detect or uh, differentiate between all these alternatives. And ALMA actually have revolutionized our view of protoplanetary disks because every disk that now we have observed with ALMA at high angular resolution show uh, structures in the disks. And this is actually something that, as I said before, we expected because the models were telling us, us, telling us that that has to happen, otherwise we wouldn't form planets. Hands. You only showed us one particular prediction, which was basically a set of narrow high density rings, right? The ALMA observations show a beautiful variety of mm -hmm. features. Um, can you, so, you know, four of which look exactly like here, one part you showed others don't. Is the, is the diversity among the morphology expected from these pressure bumps? I'm coming back to that later, but just to answer briefly, of course, all depends on what is creating these pressure bumps. In the previous simulation, we have multiple pressure bumps from MHD simulations. Could be that we have a single pressure bump or two pressure bumps, so, and that some of them are symmetric, some of them are asymmetric, so, or are expected to create asymmetric uh, structures. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the coming slides. 
Something that we want to actually um, um, test in the future with observations is the fact that radial drift depend and have a strong dependence with the stellar mass. And radial drift is expected to be more efficient around low mass stars. And you can see uh, that in this plot where we have the dust radial velocity as a function of lens size, as I showed you before. But in this case, I uh, have plotted the velocities for a disk around a typical T Tauri star and around a brown dwarf. And you can see that the velocities around the brown dwarf can be twice or even more uh, higher than in the case of the TT Tauri disks. Meaning that to trap these particles, we need a stronger pressure bumps. And actually, from observations, we have evidence that the spectral index is also low in these disks. You see that in this plot where we have the spectral index, again, as a function of flux, these are the points that I showed you before. The red points are disk around Brondorf with values lower than 3. We need to test with ALMA if actually these pressure bumps have, or these structures will have a stronger contrast compared to T Tauri and Herbie disks. And I would like now to move to our current investigation and future perspectives in this field. So one set of these that have motivated a lot of the research that I have done in the last years is transition disks. These disks are known to have an inner cavity that is mainly in observed in the dust emission. I remember in 2011, I saw an image of a transitional disk that was like calcium 15 here. It looked very similar at that time too. And there was a planet candidate inside that uh, cavity. So I thought that was an excellent uh, opportunity to test uh, particle trapping, because if we have a planet, we have a pressure bump, we form a ring, we can compare what uh, we expect from models and uh, see what are the observations telling us. Um, I test the case of a planet disinteraction, but there is another alternative that is the case of dead zones. And I would like to start with that one. So in a disk, we expect actually that uh, MRI leads to self-sustained turbulence. And the, the efficiency of this depends on how well the disk is ionized. And there are different sorts of ionization. We can have X-rays of far UV rays from the star, or we can have a cosmic rays that mainly will affect the outer part of the disks. Nevertheless, in the regions where the disk is massive, these rays cannot penetrate, and MRI will be inefficient. If we uh, assume that the turbulence of the disk can be written as an alpha, which will be called alpha viscosity times the sound speed and the uh, scale, uh, this scale high, in an active region, we expect that alpha has values of 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3, while in a dead region, we expect alpha values of 10 to the minus 4. The accretion rate is proportional to the turbulence, and as a consequence, in the active region, we have high accretion, and in the dead region, we have low accretion. And as a result, we will have an accumulation of gas at the edge of the dead zone. And we have modeled that analytically by changing alpha. And in this case, we change alpha in such a way that depends on the gas surface density to mimic the fact that in the regions where uh, the gas density is low, we expect high values of alpha and vice versa. So what you see here is the initial conditions of our simulations for the gas, it's a power law, and for, the, for alpha, which is here in this case multiplied by 10 to the minus to 10 to the 4. So in this case, in the dead region, we have 10 to the minus 4. In the after region, we have 2 times 10 to the minus 2. We have the edge of the dead zone around 20 AU, but there is a large transition region which range between 20 to 60 AU. In this moment, you see the evolution of the gas density. And you see that because accretion rate is higher here than in the dead zone, we have a pressure bump or a density bump formed at the edge of the dead zone. The bump increased in amplitude with time, but it also moved inwards with viscous time scales, and eventually it dissipates around, at around one million year time of evolution. And at the end, we end with a smooth disk 
which uh, has a sharp outer edge in the gas surface density. How long the, 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 the bump lives depends, of, depends on how far is the dead zone edge. So the farther it is, the longer it lives. And in this plot, you can see the dust evolution, um, again, as a function of grain size and distance from the star in the dead zone scenario. And as I said before, you see efficient growth in the inner disk, uh, slower growth in the outer disk, but once particles reach certain sizes, they will move towards the regions of high pressure. And they will be trapped in that location of the dead zone edge, and the, the concentration of those particles will move inwards. And once the bump is gone, you will see that all the dust move towards the star because there is nothing retaining those particles. However, while the bump leaves, there is a lot of concentration of dust, and you can see that in this plot where we have the mass of the dust as a function of time. And you see that uh, we start with the small grains, and large grains uh, slowly grow and uh, stay there for as long as the bump leaves. And the mass of the dust that we accumulate is around 100 air masses. Apart from that, we also reach high to dust to, dust to gas ratios. And that means that they actually uh, can group, or they are grouped, as I showed you before, like cyclists. And in that way, these particles can forget about the radial drift, and they can continue to grow to planetesimals. So we expect that at the edge of the dead zone, we can have planetesimal formation, and eventually the formation of a core of a, of a giant planet, and this will be a way to form the first giant planet in a disk. Once we have a giant planet in the disk, we expect the planet to open a gap in the uh, gas surface density. And you can see that in this 2D hydrodynamical simulation with a one Jupiter mass planet, and in the panel you see the evolution of the surf, uh, uh, average surface density. We have combined these hydrodynamical simulations with dust evolution models to see how is, uh, we expect the dust distribution to be in the case of planets. And you see here a snapshot of the simulations at one million year of evolution. And the white line represents the shape of the uh, gap uh, formed by the planet uh, located at 20 AU. One main result here is that the small grains follow the gas, and we expect the cavity that is formed in the small grains to be as large as the location of the outer edge of the gap in the gas, while the millimeter particles are accumulated much farther out. In this case, there is a difference of around 20 AU. So you can see by already by eye when comparing the dust density distribution of the two cases that we have very different uh, results. And we have combined these dust density distributions with relative transfer calculations to see how images will look at different wavelengths. And this is the results. In one case, we have the dead zone and the predictions for scatter light and a submillimeter emission. You see that uh, in white line, the edge of the dead zone. And you see that in both cases, we have cavities, and the cavity size is of similar size. In the case of the planet, we see also cavities, but the size of the cavities increase with wavelength. And that's because of what I told you before, that the small grains in this case are following the gas, creating a smaller cavity. And now we have actually the observations to test these models. And this uh, has been done recently in a paper of this year where we compiled 22 um, uh, disks that have been observed with a Sphere and ALMA. And what you see here is the cavity uh, detected in a scatter light versus the cavity at millimeter emission. The green line here represents uh, the location where the both, both cavities are the same size, and around one third of the sample lies very close to this relation, meaning that they can be explained by dead zones. Around two thirds of the sample show large segregation. And actually, the only evidence of planets embedded in cavities it's from a disk that show a large segregation in a small and large grains. And this is PDS-17. So to look for planets, this will be the, the perfect candidates to do so, the ones that show large segregation between the cavity size in a small and a large wavelengths. 
What if we don't have a scatter light observations? And this can happen because many disks are actually very faint to be observed with the scatter light. Well, we have also predictions uh, that show that we expect very different structures when we compare submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths. Again, I'm showing you the results of the planet versus the dead zone. And this is the dust density distribution as a function of radius. But in this case, I'm showing you the results divided in three different grain sizes. You see that in the case of planets, we have the accumulation at the outer edge of the gap, and that this accumulation becomes narrow for larger grains. This is what we expect from models. The same for dead zones, but the main difference is that the peak of this accumulation actually uh, move inwards for larger grains in the case of the dead zone. If we take a, a beam of the size of the typical observation from ALMA, we will be able actually to detect this shift um, uh, from observations. And we have tested uh, this idea recently with observations of a transitional disk known as SR24S. There is no scatter light observations showing a cavity in this disk, so we only had a submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths to test these models. And what you see here are observations at 0.4 millimeters, 1.3 millimeters, and almost 3 millimeters. And you see the radial cut of these observations, uh, the position angle of the disk showing that the, the ring peaks at the same location. That means that these observations actually favor also the planet uh, case. So we need to look for these planets in these disks. To summarize what I have said about uh, what can create these cavities in transitional disks, I show you two uh, scenarios, embedded uh, planets or dead zones. In both cases, we expect millimeter cavities. In a micron-sized cavity, it can form if the planet is massive. And we expect segregation of the uh, cavity size for the case of embedded planets, but not for the case of dead zones. The last part of my talk, I want to um, talk about Icelands. Because um, I told you a little bit in the motivation, but also when uh, these rings and gaps were started to be detected, uh, we noticed that some of these uh, cases, the locations of the gaps are r r uh, located where the islands of main volatiles in the disk are expected to be. So the water island is known to be a preferential region where we expect to have growth of uh, dust. And basically what happens in this location is that we, due to the fact that grains have ice mantles, we increase the dust density distribution. But what we expect is that the gas removes, uh, stays um, smooth. There is no variations in the gas density. And therefore, Icelands are no particle traps, but they can change the dynamics of the particles and affect uh, how the distribution of small and large grains are. And why is that? That's related with what I explained at the beginning. Particles that have a, a water ice um, mantle are more um, um, sticky, and as a consequence, in this region outside the water uh, Iceland, we expect efficient growth. And when particles grow, they will drift toward the star. And once they cross the uh, water ice line, they lose the ice mantles. And as a consequence, they will efficiently fragment. They will become small, and, uh, and as a result of that, they will drift slower. And as a consequence, we will have a traffic jam effect at that location. We have a study how these variations of the fragmentation velocity will uh, affect the dust density evolution. And based on the van der Waals forces that I explained you at the beginning, that are expected independent on the dipole moment of the, of, the, of the grains, we change the fragmentation velocity. So for instance, water is expected to have a high dipole moment, and therefore, we assume a high fragmentation velocity. But for example, CO2 or CO have low dipole moment, and they are expected to have low fragmentations as velocities as silicates. So these were our um, experiments of changing the fragmentation velocity as a function of radius. 
this is a warm disk, so around uh, 8 AU we have mainly silicates, then we have grains with waterized mantles, then we assume a variation and the location of ammonia, and also we assume again in the outer disk where we expect the CO ice line to have low fragmentation velocities as in the inner disk. Here I'm showing you the results of uh, assuming two Icelands in the disk, the water and the CO2 Iceland. And this is the dust density distribution as a function of grain size and distance from the star. We see the variations of the velocity in the fragmentation limit, which is uh, shown in blue. And you see that in the inner and in the outer disk, we recreate a lot of small grains that are well coupled to the gas and don't drift very fast. And in between, we create very large particles that are uh, drifting inwards. If we take these dust density distributions and again combine them with relative transfer calculations and predict what will be the observations um, expectations, this is the uh, flux or the intensity profile at 1.6 microns and 0.8 millimeters as a function of radius. And you see that what is expected here is that the gap in a scatter light is deeper and wider than in the millimeter emission. This is actually the opposite that what we expect from planets. We compare these results with observations of this where we know or there are evidence of the location of the CO, CO uh, ice line. And this is the case of TW Hydra where we know that it's around uh, uh, this location, 20 AU from the star, which is plotted here in the vertical line. And what you see in blue is the observations from a sphere at 1.6 uh, microns, and in black, the observations from ALMA at 0.8 millimeters. You see clearly that the gap in a scatter light is of higher contrast and is uh, wider at that location. This is in agreement with what we expect from Icelands and is in disagreement to what we expect from planets. So at least this gap here is more likely to be formed due to the variations of the dust dynamics at the location of the CO Iceland. So to summarize what can be the origin of gaps and rings, and this is extended to what I show you about the cavities, we can have embedded planets. The millimeter gap is expected, the scatter light gap could be dependent on uh, the planet mass, the disk viscosity. Uh, the viscosity variations, I show you the case of one variation due to the dead zone. So multiple variations uh, has to be studied still, but we expect that we will have uh, gaps at the two wavelengths, as in the case of the dead zone. And in the case of Iceland, we expect gaps at the two wavelengths, but the results are opposite to what we expect from planets. And with that in mind, I would like to bring uh, the summary of my talk and introduce uh, the radial drift barrier, which is one of the main problems of planet formation. But we knew from uh, decades ago that particles actually grow to millimeter sizes in this disk, and this evidence comes from the spectral index, and we didn't know how to explain these observations. And we needed a method to actually uh, overcome this problem. And we introduced the idea of having multiple pressure bumps in the disk that are trapping these particles. And we predicted that rings and gaps should be observable at high angular resolution. And this is what actually we observed uh, three years after our predictions. And transitional disks are excellent laboratories to study what is the origin of these uh, structures. And I show you here the case of planets and the zones that we can differentiate. I also talk about Icelands. And in the future, actually, we can study much more bigger samples because, for example, JWST will uh, provide us scatterlight observations of very faint disks that we cannot observe uh, nowadays. And with that in mind, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you, Paula, for this nice talk and for uh, giving us hope that we can actually distinguish between the very different scenarios um, of why these rings are there, which is, I think, the next big thing to figure out. Um, so the question, are there questions in the audience? Very cool. Um, 
All of the different mechanisms for producing inhomogeneities and pressure bumps that you talked about are more or less in situ things. Planets in the disk, uh, gas processes in the disk, but these disks are embedded in GMCs, so they might see things like inhomogeneous external potentials, they're fed uh, from accreting streams. Has anyone looked at whether or not the external environment could be the seeds for these eventually growing pressure bumps that can be the birth environments of planets? This is a very interesting question, actually. Um, I am aware of studies that have tried to explain the spider arms that we see in disk from embedded in, um, or from an envelope that is a, you are still accreting material from that envelope and due to the variations uh, of density you may create the spider arms. So that can explain the spider arms that are uh, observed in a scatter light but these are not regions of high pressure so we could not trap particles there. Um, there are other possibilities like flybys. Um, to my knowledge there are not really studies trying to uh, to see what are the predictions for scatter light on millimeter observations is something that could be investigated. And another thing uh, I'm also interested in is to study the effect of external photooperation from the presence of massive stars in the, in the cluster. Because if you have external photooperation, you uh, reduce the mass uh, or the disk uh, gas density in the outer disk, and that makes maybe the particles to completely decouple from the gas and grow bigger and maybe create some kind of structures. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Um, in, in two places you mentioned that these disks are assumed to be uh, vertically isothermal. So, um, but at least in the denser parts, I understand that these are optically thick at their relevant wavelengths. So then they should not be isothermal. Um, two questions. Am I right? Second, uh, is that relevant for your modeling? Or does, it make it, yeah, does it make a change? Uh, that's an interesting question. You are totally right. We are assuming a, a locally isothermal disk vertically. And um, yeah, it could make a change in a the, how the structures that are observed in a scatter light are, because in that case we, uh, we are tracing more the temperature profile than the density profile. So it can have an effect and it's actually very important uh, fact. Uh, indeed simulations have shown that if you uh, uh, remove this assumption, the, the contrast of a spiral arms from planet this interaction can be very different than if you assume a local isothermal. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. Uh, you talked about the interplay between uh, gas and uh, dust uh, uh, for, for explaining these uh, 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 planetary disks. Uh, is there uh, also uh, uh, some use in uh, discussing uh, uh, star formation? I mean, is, is the physics you discuss also important for star formation? Also very interesting question because so far the, the studies I have uh, shown and uh, they are focused on class 2 disks, so evolved disk or I mean in the process that we can forget about the envelope but a uh, class zero objects where uh, still there are uh, several processes from the star formation uh, having an effect in the disk. These objects, these cluster objects, also show evidence of millimeter centimeter sized particles. And there are some evidence of structures also in these disks. So it could be that planets already have formed that early, or that maybe they form already in the star formation process. Yeah. So this is something that is, has been, is now currently investigated. Yeah. You mean you need a little center, yes, uh, to start with. I mean, you have you have a uh, uh, star in the middle, yes, and uh, of course, discussing star formation, uh, uh, you, you you have to find a center first, yes, but otherwise. Yeah, yeah that, that's to, 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 totally. I totally agree with that. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Further questions? Okay. Uh, 
uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a quick question. When, when you talked about observational signatures for radial drift, um, how can we be sure that that's just not a uh, signature of different growth time scales as different radii? Because I think you showed a, a plot of, of the grain size, how uh, larger grains tended to be uh, in the inner disk and smaller grains in the outer disk. That's right. So uh, one potential evidence of that we actually have concentration and trapping is to look for variations of the spectral index within these rings and gaps. Now, this has been done, for instance, for HL tau, but the emission is optically thick in that case. So the spectral index information can be affected by that, and it cannot give us information about the dust density distribution. Now we are trying, from these observations, from ALMA to obtain uh, data at also long wavefront, that is where the emission is optically seen with a similar resolution, is more challenging because the these are fainter, but with similar resolution and sensitivity to actually detect these variations of the spectral index. So that will be an ultimate test. Okay, let me walk down first. Any further questions? Uh, if not, you can. You have uh, two minutes to think about a question while I ask a question. Uh, in one of the models, you showed that the, um, there is this um, alpha that has a, an initial profile which goes from low exactly, and then it evolves with time. Um, what is the the, in, the the physics that causes the alpha to evolve with time? Okay, so I, I didn't write the question here, but in our assumption, alpha also varies uh, as a function of the density. So since you are accumulating gas at the edge of the dead zone, we expect that because that region is more massive, the uh, ionization rate of the disk will decrease there, and that will change alpha. So the analytical profile is such that we have a feedback of alpha or, or the density increasing locally and alpha changing accordingly. Okay, that's clear. Um, any further question? If not, then let me, before we thank uh, Paula again, uh, I should have put it up, up here to show, uh, and I tend to forget that. Um, next week, we'll have uh, Jim Stone giving a talk, and let me have a brief look. His title is Radiation Dominated Black Hole Accretion Flows. So, I uh, hope to see you all uh, next week, and um, since uh, Paula is a local speaker, we will not have a uh, dinner tonight, but if, you, if you're very interested in dinner, then of course we can always uh, see if we can arrange it another time. Um, Paula will be here a couple of years, uh, we hope, um, so he's, he's up on the hill at the MPIA. Um, and I would say let's give her a big hand for her nice talk. Thank you.